It's that time again. Got a great program lined up for you today. So gather your family and get your Bibles because it's time to begin Fabric of Family. How do you explain? How do you describe? In Him, all families are blessed. Join our discussion on Fabric of Family. Michael Orr was a young man that, I guess you could say, really was not brought up in the best of circumstances, so he really didn't have very much guidance on what to do with his life. But he knew he wanted to do one thing and one thing only, and that was play professional football. He loved the game of football. Anytime he got an opportunity, he'd watch the game. And so he began to watch the guys and how they played, and he resolved that he wanted to do that the rest of his life. So he began to eat. He began to exercise. He began to get bigger and faster and stronger. And he decided he wanted to try out for the high school football team. So his ninth grade year, he did just that. He tried out for the football team. And he got, he got on the team. The coach said, you're a big guy. You can really help us out on offense and on defense. And so you can really do a lot of good things for us. And so the coach put him on the team. Little did the coach know that Michael Orr struggled in school. And so he got a copy of his transcript from the school that he transferred from. And it turns out that Michael had a 1.6 grade point average. This devastated the coach. And, and he went up to Michael and he said, Michael, you, you have a 1.6 grade point average. That's not enough. That's not good enough to play football. You're going to have to pull your grades up a little bit. And so Michael worked. He worked and he worked. He went to tutoring sessions. The, the tutors would come to his house and help him with his homework and help him study for his test. And eventually Michael pulled his grades up to where he could play football. Our world today says, nah, grades aren't important. You don't have to try hard in school. But really, what does the Bible say about trying hard in school? What does the Bible say about that? The book of Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 15 the text there says that the heart of the prudent of the wise seeks knowledge and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. So if we are truly wise, according to the world, if we're wise, we're not going to try hard in school. We're just going to throw our grades by the wayside and hope we make something of ourselves later in life. But if we listen to Solomon, while we're young and while we are wise, we will acquire knowledge. We will seek knowledge and we'll constantly be wanting to learn new things. And you may say, well, I don't like school. I've never liked school. In fact, I, I've just never been really good at school, so why should I try at it? Why should I put forth all of my effort in school? And the world says, ah, if you don't like it, don't try. If you don't like it, if it's not something that you want to be involved in, don't try. But what does the Bible say? Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10, it says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. In other words, whatever you find to do, whether you like it or not, try your best. Because in the latter part of that verse, it says, Because there is no work or device or any opportunity in the grave where you are going. That verse is basically saying, while you're alive, and while you're still active and while you're still young, work hard at whatever it is that you do because the day is going to come where you're going to die and there's no opportunity for you to work. So while you're alive and while you're healthy and while you're well, work hard at whatever it is that you do. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17, the Bible says, whatever, you're, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Verse 23 of Colossians 3, it says that whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Work in school as if God is watching your every move. And if God's watching your every move, I guarantee you, you'll work harder and you'll study harder and you'll make better grades. I'd like to conclude with one verse, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11. The Bible says that if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it according to the ability that God supplies. God has given you an ability. And God has given you a talent of trying your best and doing well 
in school. So I challenge you as a young person right now to glorify God in the classroom. Whether one believes in evolution or whether one believes in creation, why does it even matter? Why does it matter what our children are taught in public schools regarding the origin of life and the development of mankind? I mean, so what if my children or my grandchildren are taught that the world began with a big bang or man is the product of millions or even billions of years of a process called evolution? For those viewing our program today, let me just affirm in no uncertain terms, it does matter what our children are exposed to in their schools, their communities, and churches regarding the origins of life. And let me tell you why it matters. It matters because ideas have consequences. What a man or woman or child believes about who they are and where they came from is going to have a great bearing on societal and personal values. To put it in a biblical way, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7. Or to put it in a more secular way, you are what you eat. You see, what you think about governs your choices in life. It governs your ethics and the direction that you're going to take in life. Now let me just share with you what I'm talking about uh, as far as how these contrasting ideas will have an effect upon one's very being. A creationist by the name of Morris, last name, uh, once wrote, a person's philosophy of origins will inevitably determine what he believes concerning his destiny, and even what he believes about the meaning and purpose of his life and actions right now. And then I want to share with you a, a quote from an evolutionist whose last name is Mayer. He wrote, Evolution has an impact on every aspect of man's thinking, his philosophy, his metaphysics, his ethics. Now these two quotes represent two men on different sides of the coin. One is a creationist and the other is an evolutionist. There are obviously stark differences between the beliefs of these two men, but there's at least one thing that they do share in common. They both agree that what one thinks about the subject of the life and origins has an impact upon one's ethics and where one goes in life. So if you're a parent or a grandparent who has been somewhat apathetic about your children or other children being taught evolutionary theory as though it were evolutionary fact, I hope you will especially listen to our discussion today as one of our regular contributors, Kyle Butt, he's going to be with us to discuss why this subject is so important and to tell us about an upcoming event that can help to build the faith of your family in the God of heaven and earth. But before we go over to Kyle, Robert Hatfield, another regular contributor, has our tech tip of the week. Robert? Do you ever have trouble finding the truth about a subject online? You know, you can find just about anything on the information superhighway, whether it's true or not. Just yesterday, I ran across this quote online that was attributed to Abraham Lincoln. Quote, the problem with quotes on the internet is that it's very hard to verify their authenticity, end of quote. I hope you see the irony of what I just did there. Today, I want to direct you to a corner of the internet where you will definitely find the truth. And it's not just any truth either. It's the truth of God about salvation. Check out searchingfortruth.org. This website features six highly produced videos all about the truth. The, the series is titled Searching for Truth. The lessons range in length from 15 to 55 minutes. You're encouraged to watch the 15-minute video first, then you can decide whether you want to watch the others. I think you will. As I said, Lesson 1 is an introduction to the series. Lesson 2 is called Searching for Truth About the Creator. Lesson 3 is all about authority in religion. The fourth lesson is titled Searching for Truth About the Church. Number 5 is about the house of God. And number 6 is about baptism. Are these subjects that you've wondered about before? Do you find it interesting that many of these topics are the very points of disagreement among religious bodies today? Well, let me assure you, the Bible speaks on these matters. It gives us the truth, and because of that, these are really important issues. And that's why these videos were produced. Nothing is going to be shoved down your throat, so to speak, while you're watching these lessons. 
You'll be given the scriptures in a very pleasant, easy to understand, and even enjoyable way. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, John 8, 32. Why not check out searchingfortruth.org today and discover the riches of God's Word? I'm Robert Hatfield, and this has been your Family Tech Tip of the Week. Thanks for joining us for our family discussion time. I have with me uh, Kyle Butt of Apologetics Press, and uh, certainly he is no stranger uh, to those of you who watch Fabrica Family on a regular basis because you know that uh, Kyle is one of our regular uh, contributors. He has a uh, segment uh, that is called Family Faith Builders. And uh, Kyle, good to have you back with us in this format and in this setting. And uh, you are here uh, to talk about something that's coming up very soon uh, that we want to promote, and that is a debate that's going to be taking place. That's right, Barry. I appreciate you having me. And I am looking forward to a debate on April the 4th. It's going to be in Florence, Alabama, against a man by the name of Bart Ehrman. And it's a debate on the existence of the God of the Bible, and we're going to be talking about the problem of evil, pain, and suffering. All right, and so uh, I think probably most viewers, if not all, know what a debate is. But just in case, uh, let's just examine that for a moment. What is a debate? Well, I think the idea of it comes certainly straight from the pages of the New Testament. When Jesus would be approached by a Pharisee or a group of Pharisees and they would say, hey, you are teaching this, and Jesus would publicly say, well, this is what the Bible actually says. I was listening to the book of Acts, and it talks about Apollos who refuted publicly in a vigorous way, the Bible says, the people who were not following the teachings of Christ. And I think a debate is where you present publicly, in my case, I'll be presenting the truth that there is the Christian God, and someone else uses their best line of reasoning, their best argument to try to refute that. And the truth will always come out on top if you present it in a way that is according to good thinking, good logic, etc. And so in this case, a debate will simply be, Bart Ehrman will stand up and say, the suffering in the world indicates that there's no God. And I'll stand up and say, no, that's not right, and here's why. You know, I think it really goes back to the book of Proverbs where it says, the first person to plead his case seems right, until another comes and answers him. And, and I think, so that's what a debate's about. It's about uh, you know, two individuals in, in this case who are going to be discussing, uh, presenting uh, arguments, their best arguments, and, and answering uh, objections. Uh, so th th this is not like a, uh, if someone's never been to a debate, it's not like um, attending, say, um, uh, a church service where you'll have someone getting up and, and preaching for a long period of time. There, there, there's some interaction that takes place between the, the two participants, correct? Absolutely. In fact, quite a bit. The format, generally speaking, of debates that are more current, more modern, is you have a person give a 20-minute opening statement, the other person gives another 20-minute opening statement. Then you have about 10 to 12 minutes of rebuttal time where the person will say, here's what that person said, here's why that's not right. And then you'll have a period of time where one participant asks the other one questions, almost like a, okay. a lawyer type cross-examination. Okay, so it sounds like this will be a very interesting event that's going to be taking place very soon. Um, what is it that you are hoping to accomplish? What, 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 are, what is your goal? What is your objective in participating in this debate? Sure. Well, I think lots of times people go to the Internet, they get a book, and they read okay, there can't be a Christian God who loves everybody and is all-powerful because, and the skeptic will give their arguments. Mm -hmm. But they don't get to hear the other side of that lots of times. And so my goal, what I hope to accomplish is to show that this idea that suffering militates against the Christian God just simply is not right. And here's how you can answer that. And so I think that there will be lots of in fact, the, the audience that this really hits lots of times are 18 to 25 year olds. You've got people that have been going to universities, their professors have been using these types of arguments in a class situation where nobody has gotten a chance to respond and they get to see, oh hold on just a second, I've been being told this all day every day but there's really a good answer to it. Alright, all right, so specifically what, what is the proposition? Okay, the proposition is uh, Bart Ehrman will be affirming the suffering in the world indicates 
that the Christian God does not exist. And then he's going to uh, attempt to, to prove that. That's right. And I will be denying that and saying the suffering in the world does not indicate that the Christian God does not exist. Okay, so why debate Bart Ehrman as opposed to someone else? Sure. What, what, what's significant about him as an individual, his uh, contribution to uh, his field that he's in? Um, why Ehrman? That's a great question. Yeah. Here's what we found that if you were just to debate, uh, debate a person that the skeptical community doesn't accept as a legitimate spokesman for a particular idea, then when the truth is presented and that person cannot refute the truth, then the skeptical community often says, well, it's because he wasn't a good enough spokesman for that idea. So you try to get a person that the skeptical community recognizes as legitimate spokesman for this idea. Mm. And in this case, Bart Ehrman is the perfect person to do that. He's written a book called God's Problem, How the Bible Fails to Answer Our Most Important Question, Why, why We Suffer, which is a New York Times bestseller. He's written three other New York Times bestsellers. He's a professor at the University of North Carolina. He got his PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary under Bruce Metzger. If you were just to say, is there a man qualified to present the ideas in a way that the skeptical community would say, yes, that's how we would present them. Well, Bart Ehrman is the man. Is this something that, that you initiated or Apologetics Press? Is this something that, that came from uh, his side of the spectrum? Well, he does lots of these. This is not his first okay. one of these. He has debated Dinesh D'Souza on the similar topic. He's debated a man by the name of Michael Brown who is an Old Testament Bible scholar on a similar, similar topic. The Christian Student Center at the University of North Alabama has presented one of these before in which they invited me to be the participant. And I was debating a man by the name of Blair Scott and it was just on the existence of God in general. Mm -hmm. And so basically I am an invited guest just like Bart Ehrman is by the Christian Student Center there on the campus of UNA. All right, University of North Alabama there mm -hmm. in Florence. Right. Now, um, so you've engaged in uh, one or more of these in the past, correct? This will be my third. The other two have been just what I would call more general debates on the existence of God. This is the first one on this specific particular topic of pain and suffering. Now, and this is a, a, a topic that is, uh, has been debated before, the, the specific topic you're engaging in? It has been, and like I said, Ehrman has debated it a couple times. But as far as debates go, it's not as frequently debated as, say, just the existence of God in general. Okay. Well, this, this is a, an interesting uh, topic that we're talking about uh, concerning uh, the debate uh, between uh, you and, and, and Bart Ehrman that's coming up very soon. I want to continue our discussion in just a moment, Kyle. Sure. But uh, we have a, another segment, uh, a man by the name of Jim Merle. Uh, who uh, is one of the preachers for the Ironiton Church of Christ in Talladega, Alabama. Uh, he, uh, he has a short segment as well as you do from time to time. His, mm -hmm. his is called uh, Family Fortunes of Faith. And so uh, let's watch this segment together uh, with those who are viewing the program today and then we'll be back to continue our discussion. Okay, great. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord. Have you ever considered in yourself just who your friends are? You know, oftentimes as parents, we spend the majority of our time trying to help and influence our children to make good choices as far as friends go. We see sometimes friends that they have, that they run with, that are simply not very good influences in their life, to say the least. Yet at other times, we see those who are seemingly not their friends, but we know that our children would make good friends for them because they could influence one another for good. And so we encourage them in that way. But at the very same time, we lose sight of who our friends are. Now by that, I don't mean our physical friends, not anyone by the name of Jane or Joe, but I mean those who we're friendship with so far as being friends of the world itself. The Bible tells us in 1 John 2 and verse 15, to love not the world, neither things are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now he's implying in that, that when we love or have friendship, that's where we're going to carry this, that with the world, we're not going to be able to step across that proverbial fence and also have friends with God. You see, it's the case that we cannot hold hands with one and the other. As a matter of fact, James tells us, James chapter 4 and verse 4, that a friendship with the world is enmity with God. He goes on to say that when we're friends with the world, as a matter of fact, we become the enemies of God. 
Now you may say like anyone would, no, I'm not an enemy of God. I don't despise God. I don't hate God. I don't in any way want to turn away from Him. But friends, we can't have ourselves in both worlds. We can't live holding hands with a world where John would have told us where is nothing but the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and then, yea, even at the same time, claim to be fully and wholly dedicated toward God. So it's the case that as we review our lives and as we watch our children too, that we are not to be checking to see who their friends are, are they tall or what color they are, or what type of clothing they wear, but we'd be careful to see if by being a friend of that person, are they actually becoming a friend of the world? Are they actually befriended to the person for their character and for who they are and for what they stand? Or are they attracted to them because they're so worldly, because the way that they live their lives is not right in the sight of God? Friends, we have to protect ourselves as we protect our children. I encourage you, as you study your Bibles each day and you study in light of this subject and any other, that you do all that you can to find your fortunes in faith. Thank you. Well, we hope you enjoyed that short segment by Jim Murrow on uh, Friends. And we're back with Kyle Butt to, to continue our discussion about an upcoming event uh, that's going to be taking place in Florence, Alabama. Uh, Kyle, Kyle, again, when is the uh, debate going to be taking place? It's going to be April the 4th. That's a Friday night at 6 mm -hmm. o'clock there on the campus of the University of North Alabama at the Norton Auditorium. All right. If there are some viewers that would um, like to see this, sure. um, I mean, how, how, how do you go about doing that? Is it something you can get tickets for? Uh, is it something you can see online, on television? Um, what are the details? Sure. You can get tickets for it through the Student Center there at UNA. There are about... The uh, Christian Student the Christian Center. Christian Student Center, right. Okay. There are about uh, 1,700 seats. Last time we had about 1,650 of them full. And I think we didn't have the other 50 full because the debate we did prior to that, we had about 350 people show up that didn't get seats. And so I think lots of people didn't know if they were going to get a seat or not. And mm -hmm. so they stayed home and watched it live online. And that's the other option. GBN, yeah. Gospel Broadcast Network, comes and streams it live for us. And they estimated that last debate, which was about two years ago in September, they had an estimated viewership of probably about 80,000 people. Okay. And so there is quite a bit of interest in watching it online because not everybody, of course, can get to the venue. Okay, so uh, if someone wants to come or wants to see if there are, there are still tickets available, they would need to contact the uh, Christian Student Center at the University right. of North Alabama. Mm -hmm. But the other option then, as you said, is to uh, watch it streaming online through right. Uh, GBN, also known as Gospel Broadcasting Network. Mm -hmm. uh, their website is uh, www.gbntv.org. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of our viewers wants to see it online, they can go to that website. And, uh, and again, the day? April the 4th. April the 4th, what time? 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's, uh, let's talk about, uh, for just a few moments, uh, some things that uh, you know, Christians should expect to, to, to hear or perhaps be listening for as the debate takes place. Sure. Lots of times in a debate like this, the real issues sometimes get almost uh, covered over because the truth is there is a God. And that truth is very, very difficult for a person like Bart Ehrman to take head on. And so instead of really taking this head on and saying, hey, there can't be a God because of this. You're going to see some, what I would call some, some mental gymnastics, some logical runaround, I think. And one of the tactics is to just use an emotional appeal and say, hey, don't you see all kinds of evil and bad stuff that goes on in the world? How could a loving God ever allow that to happen? And so you'll see a lot of stats like... Uh, 300 people die every minute of malaria or every hour of malaria and 29,000 children die of starvation every day. And then there won't be an argument made. It will just be, hey, how can a loving God ever allow that to happen? And at first that sounds like, oh, wow, you know, how would a loving God ever allow that to happen? But then when you frame it in a little different way and you show not only is this life what we have to deal with, but we also have the afterlife and everybody recognizes that they would allow someone they love to go through a certain amount of pain. And you see that, okay, what if we were to take someone into a surgery room who had never seen a surgery and they saw somebody with their chest split wide open and their heart was out of their chest. If someone had never seen an open heart surgery, what would they think about that? If you were to say, how could a loving doctor ever take a heart out of someone's chest? Well, at first that sounds bad. 
But then if you were to say, now that doctor is using that surgery to better this person's life, well, then it makes a whole lot of better sense. Is it possible that God is using the pain and suffering to prepare people for an eternity with Him? Absolutely, positively. And then when you start to see the arguments that show that, it just makes a lot better sense, and we can show that there is a God that okay. loves people. Okay, Kyle, we've got about a minute left, and, and I just want to throw this out and, and get your, your feedback. Uh, you know, should a, should a parent be concerned that their, their child might listen to a debate like that? Do you think, what, what, what if a parent says, well, you know, I'm just afraid of what my, my child might hear? What would your response be? Well, my response to that is your child most likely is going to hear the other side of it at some time. Mm. Whether it's on the internet, whether it's from a professor, whether it's from a teacher that they have in high school, whatever. And so if you don't equip them with the information to answer that kind of argument, I think you're just doing them an injustice. And I think they really need to have the information they need to fight against those ideas that they're going to hear eventually somewhere. Well, listen, it's great to have you here with us in this venue. Uh, you do such a wonderful job with your uh, family faith builders. And uh, we certainly wish you well in this debate. This is a very, very important subject that you're talking about uh, as it relates to the God of the Bible and human suffering and, and, and how can uh, human suffering exist if God is a, is a loving God. And, and uh, I look forward to it and I hope those who are viewing our program today uh, we'll plan to be there if at all possible. Again, it's at the University of North Alabama uh, in Florence, Alabama, or watch it online. And uh, Kyle, thanks for being with us. Thanks a lot, Barry. Appreciate it. Truly, there's a battle that is raging in the world today. And it's not just a battle of missiles or guns or jet planes. In fact, it's far greater than that. You see, it's a battle for the mind. And if the devil can convince us or our children that there is no God and that we're just the product of evolutionary chance and ethical values are not absolute, well then Satan has us exactly where he wants us. Fabric of Family is brought to you by Churches of Christ in your area. And some of these congregations are listed in the credits to follow. We hope that you'll visit with one of these churches listed and let them know how much you appreciate their support a fabric of family. In our program next time, we're going to talk with Stefan Darby, who is the owner of a company called Advance Information Technologies, located in Florence, Alabama. Stefan will be with us to talk about the impact of technology on the home and how parents can be proactive in insulating their children from the dangers that it poses. And so for the Jackson Heights Church of Christ in Florence, Alabama, and the supporting congregations of Fabrica Family, I'm Barry Gilreath, wishing you and your family a wonderful week.